Leeds. I'm delighted to talk about actually a, a company that uh, Peter Donnelly and I are co-founders of uh, called Genomics PLC. And we're working in the space of trying to use genetic data to make sense of the vast data sets that are accumulating ar around human health and the many different types of modalities that, that are sort of relevant to um, understanding health trajectories and why people get sick. I think from the perspective of this meeting, there are some really interesting parallels with things that are happening in other parts of, sort of machine learning generally. But I think there are some also quite domain specific areas which I, I will try and draw out as sort of reasons where, where I see sort of concordance and, and divergence. So uh, just about me, my, my day job is actually as director of a biomedical big data institute in Oxford, which is all about um, collating and uh, collecting and analyzing and making sense of and translating the very large scale cohort size data sets linking routine healthcare data, deep in sort of information gathering about uh, sort of modalities from genomics to imaging and, and trying to make sense of that. But um, as I said earlier, um, this work is about the company Genomics PLC. And the starting point for it is, as I'm sure everyone here knows, is that as we go through life, we leave behind uh, in our wake this incredibly rich and diverse set of data about health state. It's everything from um, your, your records when you go to see the doctor or you end up in hospital. Um, things to do with which medication you're prescribed. There are certain types of information that might be gathered at particular points in your life, for example, screening or imaging data. You can have records which are not immediately around health, like employment or, or where you live. Um, and these incredibly rich data are full of opportunity and, and potential for learning about why people get sick, and what you can potentially do to intervene. Now, of course, along the way, there are an awful lot of sort of smaller scale micro decisions that you might be making on a daily basis about which treatment to put someone on or whether to send them to this specialist or another. Many places where machine learning might be being used regularly. But actually, the, the problem I'm talking about is, if you like, the higher level one of trying to understand the sort of the full space of human health or human phenotype generally. Now, of course, when you collect these data sets and you, you pour through them, even apart from all the horrible problems to do with confounding, there's vast amounts of correlation here. We, we all know that there's huge amounts of information in this. But of course, the key problem, if you are trying to work out why people get sick and what you can do to intervene, is to understand the causality. You have to be able to understand causality to make good choices about where to intervene. Now, within these different things that you can measure, there's one type of data which is actually unique in this respect in allowing you to learn about causality, and that is genetics or genomic variation. So we all have a genome. The genome is given to us at birth. It's sort of randomized with respect to your parents' genomes. And so you, you kind of have no say over the genetic makeup that you inherit. Within this, there are vast numbers millions of differences, many of which have a small impact, often very small, but an impact on how genes work, when they get turned on, how much they're expressed, how they interact with other things, and so on. And these sort of tiny little nudges accumulate across your genome in such a way that it influences how you end up looking and, and your, the diseases you're likely to get. Now, one of the good things about genetics is that as a type of information, it's actually remarkably easy to measure. There are nice machines that you can spend quite a lot of money buying, uh, which will read your genome incredibly accurately. And so over the last 10 years or so, there's been a huge uh, revolution in our ability to take genomic data for large numbers of individuals, measure some kind of outcome, whether or not you get heart disease, for example, and work out which of these little genetic perturbations is strongly associated with that outcome. Now, as I'm going to say in a second, it's actually a long way to go from that initial observation to a, 
any kind of biological understanding. But what's, why people get ex so excited about this is that those associations, those nudges, so here in the middle is a sort of, a sort of plot that you'll see in lots of genetics papers. This is your genome, um, and what you're looking for are little spikes that say, here's a bit of the genome that associates with a particular disease, in this case, high cholesterol. Each one of these little peaks is an independent, causally associated interaction between something happening at the genetic, molecular, cellular level and that outcome. And there's no way it can, the arrows can be going the other way. There is only one direction here. And that's why genomic data is, it has this primacy and importance which is kind of unique in the study of biomolecular data. So a lot of work uh, has already happened, and you know, excitingly for us, there's a huge amount more happening across the world. A lot of places, the UK and US among them, have sort of realized the potential of getting biological insight by linking the routine healthcare data that you might extract from the UK, the NHS, to um, genomic data. So here's just a small number of the, the large-scale projects, these ones I've chosen because they're sort of more or less um, advanced. Some, like um, the UK Biobank study, already has data on half a million individuals uh, with very deep phenotyping and healthcare data. Genomics England is a big sequencing project uh, in the UK. Similar efforts in China. Things happening in the pharmaceutical uh, space in collaboration with healthcare providers in the US. And, of course, the big... Uh, Precision Medicine Initiative in, in the U.S., which is just beginning to get away, uh, get get off the ground. It's probably about 10 years behind the U.K. in this front, um, but will ultimately yield a huge amount of information. So lots of data is going to flow, and uh, the company that we've set up is essentially in the job of trying to make sense of this, to learn about human biology. So I think, again, in terms of the context of this uh, forum, one of the things we're doing here, what we're trying to do here is to learn about human biology, which is a funny task, because it's not like there's an immediate thing that we have to solve. We are trying to sort of use all these data to create a map, hence the wiring diagram in the title, of how bodies work ultimately, how humans work. So that's the, the mission. Um, now, of course, a lot of the work, and both Peter and I uh, come very much from the academic side, a lot of the work to date has gone on in the academic space. So that obviously raises, raises the question of why a company is the right vehicle for this kind of activity. And I think when you start looking at the challenges that are associated with trying to make sense of all of these data, you sort of begin to see why sort of commercial activities uh, really are essentially the only way of uh, the only way forward when you're trying to integrate data from so many different places with such heterogeneity lots of restrictions on how you can use the data lots of requirements on how you can report how you must report back to the data generators lots of issues just around data storage qc um, lots of issues about how you just search and explore the data and that's all before you've got to any of the fancy and interesting analyses. And it's these kinds of tasks which are essentially uh, very standard across all the things that we'll have heard about in the last two days um, that make the sort of company angle uh, a sensible approach. So there's this sort of professional software development, scalable d data architecture, combined, of course, with the nice algorithms and scientific insight that's necessary to make this work. Now, of course, I said we're learning about human biology. Uh, that's a very grand, very lovely uh, task for us to, to work on. It's not going to immediately pay the bills, though. So how are we intending to use these data initially? Well, there's, there's already a space in which these data are proving incredibly valuable, and that is to the pharmaceutical industry. So uh, this rather depressing curve on the left shows uh, the amount it costs to get a successful drug to, to market. Um, it's on a log scale, and you can see there's been a sort of nice exponential decay over the last 50, 60 years. So to date, there's only roughly a 12% chance of a molecule in phase one 
ever being improved. It takes about 1.4 billion on average to get a, a drug through to, to market, uh, which means when you put it all together that your the market value of the drug that you make has to be on the order of $3 billion. These are incredibly scary numbers. And as you can imagine, there are many people running around saying that the whole drug development program is broken, essentially. These, these numbers are not supportable. And you can see the graph is only going one way. So why is it the case that drug development is so bad? It's not because there aren't vast numbers of very smart people in the pharmaceutical industry. But one of the chief problems has essentially been that when you're starting at the top and trying to get things into this chain, often the decisions about what to put in there are taken with rather limited and often negligible information about what the likely impact of that intervention is, is going to be. Is it going to fix the thing that you care about? Is it going to have nasty side effects? And that's precisely where genetics comes in, because genetics essentially gives us all of these mini randomized trials where people have been exposed to different amounts of gene or gene activity from birth. And so if you can see that a particular bit of the genome lights up as being associated, say, protective to heart disease, um, and you can understand the pathway that that goes through, then that immediately tells you something about the likely effect of pharmaceutically hitting that particular um, target. Now, of course, that doesn't mean to say you're going to end up with a successful drug. There are many reasons why drugs fail. Um, but knowing that it's a good place to start uh, is important, clearly. And there are <coughs> published papers uh, saying that genetic data uh, gives you at least a twofold advantage in this, which is a, a massive effect on, on this scale. Now, here's a nice quote from David Altshuler, who's the CSO at Vertex Pharmaceuticals in Boston saying genetics is the most powerful tool we have today to understand human biology. So I wanted to give a little bit more sense about exactly what we are trying to do. And, and again, to think about how this is similar or dissimilar to some of the machine learning uh, tasks. So what we're trying to do is essentially something very, very specific. We're looking for a wire in the human wiring diagram where we can design an intervention which will improve people with a particular health state. So it's an incredibly precise statement we're trying to make. Why is that hard? Well, um, as I said, we can measure DNA, and we can measure state, and we can measure sort of how they relate to each other. We can find bits of DNA where there's a genetic variant which is strongly associated with you ending up in a particular state. This is a brain scan of someone with uh, multiple sclerosis. And so we can do that bit really quite easily. But the problem is that biology has this nasty habit of being complex. And so in the middle, between the DNA and uh, the end state, there's all sorts of stuff going on. DNA is not acting directly. It's going to influence a nearby gene or a protein. And that protein sits as part of a pathway that's interacting. That pathway may only be active in certain cells at certain times. And again, the context of the tissue, the organ, or the particular environment, for example, whether or not you've had an infection, um, or, your, or how much you're eating, these can all have a substantial impact and interact with all these things to influence your final state. And so to go from there to there, we have to sort of be able to map out everything in between. And that is why it's a, a bit of a challenge. So then just to say a few words about what we've done. So our starting point is that there's a lot of data out there already. We've put a lot of effort into collecting that. So to date, we've got data on about a half a thousand distinct uh, measurements of health and disease. And that includes lots of disease endpoints, but a lot of other things to do with where genes are being expressed or how they're being expressed, the proteins that are kicking around your body, metabolites, um, things to do with how big you are or how your BMI. So lots of different measurements. Um, to date, we're looking at about uh, 14 million little sort of bits of the genome where we know there's genetic variation. And we have data spanning about 3 million or so um, individuals. 
we put a lot of effort into the uh, the organization of the data and the sort of the crunching and the, our ability to sort of interact with that in a sensible way and sort of explore what's going on. Um, and what I thought I'd do just to sort of walk you through where, where we're trying to get to is to give you some sense of those components that I talked about, you know, to go how you go from the raw DNA through to an insight about the, the molecular process and, and, and the target. So, how, so given all the data and the fact that we spent a lot of time um, sticking it into systems that allow us to explore it, what are the steps that we need to do to build this thing that I'm calling a, a wiring diagram? Well, the first thing that we have to do is, as, as I said at the start, we've got to find those bits of the genome where people, people in this room, are carrying different versions of the DNA which is influencing that endpoint. And so if you, if you take any particular trait, this is now a circular representation of the genome, you can look at the signal across the genome for where the variation that affects this trait actually sits. So you find um, all of these regions. You can do that for one trait. You can start putting related traits together. So for example, you can take different types of cholesterol and stick them together. And, and then by the time you've sort of put all the traits together in sensible ways, then you end up with actually vast amounts of signals. So we're going to start in a good place. About 3% of all the bits of the genome that we're looking at, we believe are strongly associated with some particular phenotype. To give you an example of uh, zooming in on a, on a region, <coughs> this is the region of the genome around uh, an enzyme, uh, the gene that codes for an enzyme called HMG co-reductase. That happens to be the target of statins, which is the cholesterol-reducing drug. Now, there is variation in this region, which, again, people in this room will carry. And if you look at genetic association, you find um, what the red blocks are around here show is that there's genetic variation in this region that strongly associates with a sort of set of phenotypes which, which relate to fat metabolism and heart function. Now, of course, this, you can see here's a gene, but here are lots of other genes. And this signal is very broad, so you don't immediately go from signal to gene. In this case, we know the answer because um, it's a, it's a well-studied protein. So given these initial signals, the next thing we have to do is to try and zoom in on which bit of these regions there is the variant that is influencing this trait. Now, um, genetic data is, or genetic variation data, is a, is a somewhat complex beast. It has a structure which um, some evolutionary biologists like I used to be and Peter used to be at some level uh, spend a, have spent a lot of time thinking about. It's got, a, it's got a complex structure which we kind of understand is generated by a particular process to do with um, ancestry and evolution. What that means is you don't go immediately from a genetic study to saying, here's the particular DNA variant that influences that trait. Rather, there's uncertainty about that. So this is an example from a region of the genome um, where genetic variation influences a whole load of autoimmune diseases and also expression of a gene. It's called IRF5. There's the gene IRF5, but you can see there are other genes in the region. There's a lot of signal around here, but what we want to do is to try and work out which of the variants in this region, which of these dots, essentially, is the one driving the signal. And it turns out there isn't just one. In fact, there are multiple regions here that are driving the signal. These sort of, this sort of cat's cradle figure is trying to give you a sense of what those look like. And, and there's uncertainty in that. We cannot be, we cannot be precise. It could be that, uh, or it could be that. And we sort of we have to measure how much certainty we have about these different distributions, and sort of average over all these different um, views or samples from from the distribution of plausible models. So that allows us to sort of pinpoint plausible models for genetic variants that are um, driving. So then the next thing we need to do is to work out well we know which DNA variant it is, but which gene is it going through? And again, that's not an easy thing to do because. <coughs> 
most of the DNA that is associated with a trait doesn't influence the gene by knocking out a bit of its molecular machinery directly. Rather, it affects the bits of gene that often sit many, many thousands or even millions of base pairs away from the gene which are to do with regulation, when genes are turned on and off and so on. And so we had to develop, again, other methods for working out which genes these signals are being driven by. And the short version, this isn't a, again, there's a lot of uncertainty, and we have to carry that uncertainty through the analyses. But to date, about a third of the genes we can sort of, sorry, a third of the hits we can reliably map to a particular gene. And that allows us to do things like work out how much activity or how much variation around a particular gene influences many different phenotypes. So these sort of speedo plots are um, for three genes, which have been picked out for particular reasons. This is glucokinase uh, receptor, which, mod which is really involved in glucose metabolism. Genetic variation in this gene hits everything you can possibly measure in the human genome. It's the, we have this term called pleiotropy. It's the most pleiotropic gene in the genome, which means it's a lousy drug target because you would be hitting lots of different um, processes if you tried to modify that gene. In contrast, here's one, PCSK9, which is incredibly selective for one particular trait, in this case, cholesterol, and there are now approved drugs targeting PCSK9 for cholesterol. Here's a nice example of another gene uh, where actually there's basically nothing happening, I, but I picked it up because this is a, a target that GSK spent 800 million pounds pursuing uh, and turned out to be a complete failure. So uh, we can sort of begin to work out which genes are influencing uh, which bits of the um, space of human phenotype. And then what we want to start doing is to draw those different views on genetic association to identify underlying pathways. So here's a plot showing how a whole bunch of different, in this case only about 50, but there are 50 independent bits around the genome where what I'm looking at is how variation at these bits of the genome associate with a whole bunch of different traits. And they're clustered in such a way that you can begin to see that there's sort of commonalities between these different genetic variants. These sit in very different bits of the genome, but they're, and they're acting through different genes, but they're having a sort of similar impact across measurements relating to weight, HDL, autoimmune disease, blood pressure, and so on. So one thing we want to do is to sort of learn about the latent low-level um, structure within this kind of data. That's what we essentially mean by pathways. And so we can develop sort of statistical techniques or, um, which say, given all these different genetic variants and all the different phenotypes down at the bottom, can we identify these sort of underlying factors which describe how different SNPs sort of co-cluster with each other? What are, the, what are the underlying pathways? So in this case, which is relating to coronary heart disease, we find a cluster of SNPs, a um, reasonable number of genes across the genome, which are affecting heart disease all through a um, uh, cholesterol, essentially, uh, pathway, although interestingly, these also influence Alzheimer's disease. There's another pathway we can pick out, which is through height. Now, height, unfortunately, is not very modifiable. Um, so in terms of a drug target, that's not going to be very good. But uh, there's a, it tells you there's a pathway that is associated with height that influences your risk of heart disease. Tall people uh, are lower risk. There's another pathway that goes through blood pressure. No great surprise, perhaps, but it's good to see the genetic evidence. So that means we can start to sort of identify these underlying pathways. And then, as I said, what the final step, if you like, is to map these pathways to cell types, tissues, and organs to work out not just what pathway is active, but where it's being active, where it's important. And again, we, we, we have to develop methods for doing this. And um, these exploit, uh, sort of, again, exploit our sort of understanding of the structure of genetic variation, as well as these studies. Um, and we can start to see interesting patterns. So this is a heat map showing 
how um, a whole bunch of different tissues or organs um, show association with different disease phenotypes or, or measurements. So, for example, there's a bunch of diseases down here, uh, which are all basically autoimmune diseases, which are not surprisingly, the, all the genetic signals seem to reside in um, immune cells or hematopoietic cells, blood cells. There's another class here, very strong enrichment uh, for signals associated with I IBD around the gastrointestinal tract. Again, that's good news. And, and then you start to find interesting novelty like BMI. The strongest of signals for BMI are all to do with the, ce the central nervous system. It's all to do with um, how people behave, essentially. So uh, hopefully I've given you some sense of what it is we're trying to do and how we're using <coughs> statistical methods at some level related to, to machine learning uh, to try and pick out the, um, the underlying components and to identify ways in which we can intervene. Uh, just to go back to the very start, I said what we're trying to learn is the wiring diagram. And I think this is, this is a good analogy uh, for what it is we're trying to learn. But it's also somewhat distinct from the discussion that was just before lunch about sort of interpretability, because a wiring diagram is, by definition, you know, as interpretable as it gets. So, and, and when it comes to trying to design interventions, that is a really important feature to have. You've got to have that interpretability. Having said that, a lot of the successful drugs that were developed a long time ago, we still have no idea how they work. But that's not how people are designing drugs today. Now, of course, that's the theory, and, and, and we're on a mission to do this. But of course, the truth is that the, um, the wiring diagram probably looks something more like this. Uh, and so it's going to be a fun and entertaining challenge to try and uh, pull it apart. And with that, I've, I'll end and just thank um, the many people who've contributed and many data sources that we've had to draw on to get as far as we've got. Thank you. <laughs>